Hey guys, welcome back to The Curly Reader. My name's Amanda and today I'm going to share with you all of the books that I read in April. Alright, so I'm in a little bit of a different location today. We have some stuff going on. The husband hurt himself. He has taken over our bedroom, which is where I normally film. My kids have taken over the rest of the house, so I have been relegated to the basement to at least attempt to get this done. Um, I've been putting it off and putting it off, trying to hope for like a time that worked better. And you know what? Sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do, right? We're just gonna make it work. So let's get into the books. In the month of April, I read a total of 11 books, which I am very happy with. Of those 11 books, I had five five-star reads. Like what in the actual world? Um, and then I had four four star reads and two two star reads. You know what? That's really funny. I just like put all of that together. Five five stars, four four stars, two two stars. That's it. That's what I had. Um, so that's kind of fun. But um, of the 11 books, six of them were books that I owned and five of them were books that I borrowed either from Scribd or from my local library. Um, then I had six audiobooks and five books that I read with my eyeballs. Um, five middle grade books, two YA books, four adult books, one graphic novel. So that's kind of how the stats ended up for the month. Um, so yeah, let's just kind of dig in. I think I'll start with my two two star reads. Actually, I also DNF two books. So I'll quickly mention those two books and then we'll go two star reads, then four star reads, then five star reads. How about let's do that. So the two books that I DNF'd, the first one was unfortunately a book that I was buddy reading and we both DNF'd it and that is Spare and Found Parts by Sarah Maria Griffin. Um, this was a book that I was reading with Chantel from An Intentional Life. We had both picked it up from Book Outlet. It was a cover by. It sounded really good. Um, it is about a girl who lives in, it's like a dystopian book, um, and she lives in a time where her dad saved basically the world, I think, when your father's a genius, who saved you and many others from a devastating virus with his invention of biomechanical limbs. Honestly, this is how far we got into the book before we DNF'd it. Part of the reason why is because there were like alternating chapters that were told in second person and it was really convoluted and hard to read and neither one of us really wanted to continue reading it. We got like three chapters in and we're like, I'm good. So unfortunately, that means that one got DNF'd and will be getting donated. Um, but that was on my like 10 books that I wanted to read in 2021. So I got that knocked off the list. Um, the other book that I DNF'd, and this is going to be kind of an unpopular opinion, I think, is Get a Life Chloe Brown by, I think it's Talia Hibbert, I think is the name or of the author. Um, I was looking for something like a rom-com, funny, lighthearted. I just, I, at the beginning of April, um, we lost a very, very dear friend and I was dealing with a lot of emotion and, um, I needed something that was going to be light. And so I tried that one and honestly, there was too much language in it for me. Um, I don't mind, um, swearing in books but it has to serve a purpose and this for me was just unnecessary and kind of like out of left field sometimes and then on top of that it was very um sexual <laughs> i don't know how else to really say that um there was a lot of intimate things um and intimate thoughts about people that you didn't know and it was just i don't it wasn't what i was looking for and i honestly don't think i will go back to it because I don't think my feelings about the reasons that I DNF'd it will change. So that one is unfortunately going to be a permanent DNF. So then moving on to my two star reads. I had two. The first of which was one of my other buddy reads of the month, which is really sad. Um, but I buddy read Black, White, and the Gray by Mashama Bailey and Jono Morisano. Um, I buddy read this with Kim from Book Marks and Breadsticks. Yeah, I said that right, I think. Um, and so I was really excited. She reads pretty much only food 
food books um, and food literature, I think is what it's called. I don't know. Anyway, but, and she was excited to read this. I was excited to read this. The premise of it sounded really fascinating. Um, it is about Jono Morisano and Mashima Bailey. Mashima is a black woman. Jono is an Italian white man. And they became business partners and renovated a dilapidated, formerly segregated Greyhound bus station in Savannah, Georgia into a like top notch restaurant. And it just kind of tells their story. So I'm going to try to keep this like condensed because I have feelings about this book. Bottom line, they both wrote a preface for the book or a foreword or whatever. I don't honestly remember what they called it, um, but it was like before the book, right? They both wrote one and in it, Mashima basically says, I never wanted to write this book. This was Jono's project and he basically showed me that I needed to help contribute to it and so I did. And you could tell that throughout the entire book. Jono's voice was very loud. Mashima was just like, would kind of, it wasn't even in alternating chapters. It was just like alternating viewpoints throughout the chapters. And so Jana would tell this whole story and then she would just throw in a one liner. Yep. That's the way it happened. Nope. That's not the way it happened. Um, and it just, I didn't like it. I think it would have been better if Jono just would have wrote the book. Um, However, I do understand that she has a voice that needs to be heard. She is a black woman, head chef of a very nice restaurant, which is pretty much unheard of. Um, and so she has a voice that needs to be heard. She did not want to write a book. And you could tell that reading it. And it was really unfortunate. Um, the timeline was very like weird. It would like go back and forth between things. It didn't really focus on the aspect of the creation of this restaurant that I wanted it to. It, it focused on like things that were more repetitive and minuscule in the grand scheme of things that I, I wanted to hear about how Mashima took her like Southern roots mixed with you know, her world culture and made this into a, you know, the restaurant that it is. And, and also referencing, you know, this Greyhound station and the history of the building and what it meant to her and the aspects about that, I loved, I absolutely loved, but there was so much other stuff that didn't really matter. And I felt like they were almost trying to make an issue out of race in areas where it really, it doesn't come across that it was an issue until they forced the issue. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm not saying it wasn't an issue because it may very well have been. I was not there. I don't know. But in the reading of the book, it didn't come across like it was an issue. It came across like they, they, not that they fabricated it, but that they put more emphasis on the race aspect of it than really needed to be. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. It also very much read like Jono thought that this would be another money making scheme. And so, hey, I bet we can make some money if we write a book. Let's write a book and we'll make money off of it. That's what it sounded like. So it was not, not my favorite. I gave it two stars only because there were aspects of it that I did like. Just overall, it was not for me. All right. All right, my other two star book was another one of my um, 10 books that I want to read in 2021. And that is History of the Bees by Maya Lunde. Um, this is actually, Maya Lunde is actually Norwegian, I believe. I'm going to look really quick to make sure I'm not saying that wrong. Yeah, Norwegian. And so this is actually a translated work. Um, and it was interesting. It follows three different um, time frames. One is in 1852, one is in 2007, and one is in 2098. And it has to do with bees and beekeepers and what's going on with the bees and how the humans are interfering with the bees and how that affects the world as a whole. Um, I just was bored. Like, I, I honestly, I was just bored by this. It was not compelling. I, you know, there was nothing really driving the story forward for me. Um, 
it was just really boring. So I did read it. I finished it in its entirety. It just was not for me, which is really, really sad because this cover is beautiful. And I looked up her other books and the cover is absolutely gorgeous. And I'm like, oh my goodness. But this cover, you can't even, like, it's gold. Ugh, it's so pretty. But the contents of it were not great. So that's unfortunate. All right, um, now let's move on to all the other books, which were great. So moving on to four star reads. Um, the first one that I have is Echo's Sister by Paul Mosier. Um, this is a middle grade book that I had started during middle grade March, but hadn't finished. Um, I had wanted to read it. This is another one off of my 2021 reading list. You guys, I killed my 2021 reading list this month, like killed it. Uh, which is good because I hadn't read anything I don't think up until this month except I read one in March whatever anyway all that to say this is about a girl L who is in fifth grade I believe um, either fifth or sixth grade she's starting a new school she's so excited about it and on the first day of school she finds out that her sister has this very rare form of cancer um, and has been hospitalized and the whole book pretty much centralizes around how her her younger sister who's six years old how her sister's cancer is affecting her um, how other people are treating her because of it how everything that anybody does for her is related to her sister's cancer um, her friend will give her a gift and it will be something related to her sister's cancer her you know somebody will say something to her and it's related to the cancer or you know whatever and so um, it was very, I don't know, it was very good. There were a couple of like loose ends in this that I'm like, oh, I wish they would have gone somewhere different with that. Um, but I did find out that Paul Mosher wrote this because his daughter was going through cancer at the time. And um, it was actually published soon after his daughter passed, which was really sad. Um, but it was really good. It just there were a couple of like loose threads that I wish would have like been wrapped up a little bit better or had some sort of conclusion. Um, sorry if you can hear the stomping up above, but it is what it is. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not, but um, anyway, so this one, it was good. I still, I would still recommend reading it, um, especially like if you have a kid, I would say if you have a kid who has a friend who has a sibling going through like I don't know as though I would hand this to a kid who has a sibling going through cancer um but I think that it does give good perspective on how to treat people who have siblings that are going through terminal illness so that one got four stars all right next four star book I have to like keep looking I have my journal down here with all my ratings and my books and trying to keep everything straight so um the next one is the book that I read aloud to my kids you guys this is probably my favorite book that I've read aloud to them. It's a four star for my personal like enjoyment of the book as a whole. But honestly, this is like one of my top books I have ever read to my kids. And this is Fire, the Wolf Keepers, Fire Keepers. Wrong book, Amanda. The Wolf Keepers by Elise Broach. Um, this was a cover buy off of Book Outlet for me. I had never heard of it before, but I have a daughter who is obsessed with wolves. And so I thought I would get this and the cover was cute, you know, whatever. I probably paid like two or three dollars for this book. And we just kind of decided to read it on a whim. Um, this is the story about, I don't even remember what her name is, Lizzie. Um, Lizzie's dad is the head zookeeper at a wildlife, what do they call it, a wildlife park? It's a zoo in um, California. And she comes across a boy that is basically like squatting there. He has run away from his foster family and he's been like sleeping at the zoo after hours and she finds out and they become friends. And then they notice that the wolves at the zoo are starting to get sick and something fishy is going on. And they don't know what's going on, but then the wolves start dying. And so they start looking into it more. This has a lot to do, um, or not a lot to do, but this, has to do with John Muir, who is a popular, famous, whatever, naturalist who lived in Yosemite. Um, the place that Lizzie lives is about an hour away from Yosemite um, National Park. And so it has to do with John Muir, who had a cabin in Yosemite that has been lost. Nobody's been able to find it. 
And so it has to do with that. There's talk in here about like the first female park ranger. Um, there is a lot of discussion in here just about ethics and zookeeping ethics and why animals are in zoos in the first place. And there's also moral questions like, is it okay to do something wrong for a right reason? Um, that question comes up in here. There's conversation in here, um, her friend Tyler, who has run away, about his mom. And his mom has dealt with some addiction issues. And you're seeing the effects that that has on a kid and mentally dealing with the fact that, you know, he feels like his mom has chosen something over him. Um, it's it's just there's so many good conversation points in this book it's continuously driving the book forward I felt like it was so good there were just a couple like really this is like a 4.6 like if I wanted to get really technical about this but and I dropped it to four I might actually bump this up to a five because I loved it that much because there's just I feel like I feel like people should be reading this I've never heard of it before I I just there's so much good in this. There's so much learning. There's conversation about John Muir, who he was, how Walden and Thoreau like would go to visit him, how Teddy Roosevelt would go to visit him in Yosemite and who these people were and what they represented and why nature's important and just so many, so many good things in this book. Ah, everybody go read it. All right. I'm going to stop talking about that now. All right. Another four star read from this month is a graphic novel, Allergic by Megan Wagner Lloyd and Michelle Me Nutter. Um, this is a graphic novel about a girl who really, really, really wants a dog and her parents finally tell her she can get a dog and then she goes to pick the dog out and she finds out she's allergic to dogs, like really bad, you know, allergic to dogs. And so she can't get a dog and she's allergic to pretty much anything with fur or feathers. So she can't really get a pet. She tries a few different things. She tries like keeping small things that are secrets from her parents and none of it works out. And it's, it's a good, it's fun, um, fun story just about her and her desire to have a pet and her inability to really fulfill that desire. Um, the only reason I gave this four stars instead of five is the end is really weird. <laughs> like it's very rushed and then it's just kind of doesn't really make a lot of sense and so but the book as a whole with the allergies and how some kids are allergic to things and you can't really help it and you know all this stuff it was it was good it was fine um all right and then the last four star book that I have is another book from my 2021 reading list and that is I Will Always Write Back by Caitlin Ali Ferenka and Martin Gonda with Liz Welch so I'm sure she helped them write it but this is a story about Allie and um, Martin and when Allie was in seventh grade her class was given the assignment to pick a country in the world and they had to write a pen pal from that country so the teacher would find you know a pen pal for them they had to write a letter and so Allie wrote a letter to Martin who lived in Zimbabwe um, and he was like top of the class and so there were only like a couple of letters and not everybody was going to get one but because he was top of the class he got called first and so he got her letter and it's all about the friendship that ensues between Allie and Martin over the years. It goes all the way up until when they start attending college. It talks a lot about their lives and um, the differences in their lives and the way that they are brought up. Um, the only reason I gave this four stars instead of five stars is there is a very clear element of white savior, you know, like thing in here. Um, Martin is very poor, lives in poverty, and Allie starts sending him money and paying for things for him to like help him. And her mom goes on this crusade to try to get him into college in the United States. And they start taking care of Martin and his family and things like that. I didn't care for really that aspect of it, um, but the friendship that they had and the way they respected each other, I thought was really good. Um, so I did really enjoy this one and I would encourage you to, to um, read it. It was a lot of fun. And there's a picture of Allie and Martin. So fun. So anyway, so that was another one that I read and that was also a nonfiction book that I got to read this month. Actually, that was two nonfiction books that I read this month. Hey! Go me. Um, all right. 
So now we are on to five star books. So the first one that I have is actually the book that I ended up reading at for my rom com that I was looking for um, back when I was like, you know, not doing super well. And I ended up listening to The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary. And you guys, I loved this book so much. I had heard so many mixed reviews that like dissuaded me from reading this. Um, I heard that Leon's voice in this book, the male, was like really choppy and people couldn't connect with him and they found, found it hard to read and all that. And I just, I loved him from the start. This is a book about, Leon is the male name. No, Leon is not the male name. I'm thinking of something else now. I don't remember. It's a story about this couple. Um, they end up getting an apartment together. He has an apartment and he works nights and he doesn't need it during the evening when he's at work. And so he decides to rent it out to this girl who is basically um, uh, ending an abusive relationship. And so she moves in and she gets the apartment from like five o'clock in the evening until eight o'clock in the morning. And then he gets it from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the evening and they never meet. Um, and so then they start leaving each other notes on post-it notes and start communicating that way and developing a little bit of a friendship and a relationship. And it just kind of goes from there. And it was so good. I loved it every aspect of this book um there is talk of like abusive relationships gaslighting that sort of thing um he is getting um the main male protagonist as dealing with issues with his brother being in prison and trying to seek justice for that she's dealing with this ex-boyfriend situation you know and so they're they have their own things going on but i just loved their relationship I loved both of their voices like Lee or I keep wanting to say Leon and I don't think that's right and I cannot remember and I listened to it I didn't read it so I don't even have it I can't even flip it open it's gonna bug me but I loved his voice like I know a lot of people couldn't connect with it I loved it this was so good so highly recommend if you're in the mood for a good rom-com um but and I don't even know if it's like rom-com is the right because I mean, there were funny parts to it, but it, whatever. You get what I mean. All right. And then the next um, five-star read, oh my goodness, I'm having such a hard time talking. The next five-star read is Ray Bear by Jordan Fuego. You guys, I went into this very cautiously. It is a really hyped YA fantasy, which I don't always get along with very well. It's not always my cup of tea this was so well done so well done the narrator also was so good um this is a, it's like a africa af afrocentric oh i don't know if that's the right words um fantasy and it was just so good so it follows I'm not gonna remember her name because that's who i am as a person um she basically has been raised completely secluded from society she doesn't know what's going on and then her mother sends her to basically be with the prince um to like be one of his um selected few to protect him and or to vie for that option like she's put into this like ring of people who can vie for this option but then her mother wants her to kill him and she doesn't want to but she feels like compelled to, but she doesn't want to. And so it's this constant battle of her really caring for the prince and her feeling conflicted about what her mother told her to do versus what her, what she's actually feeling. And it's just, and then it turns into this whole fantasy world of, you know, mass chaos. It was so good. I loved this entire book. It was long, but I felt like each section kept moving the story forward and it was just so well done. This is definitely one that I had to slow down on with the audio because I kept missing things and I wasn't getting into it. And I was like, this is all just like, whoa, too much. And so I slowed it way down and then it was fine. And I loved it so much. Highly recommend. I'm very excited to read Redemptor, which is a sequel that's coming out in August. So excited for that. So anyway, if you're looking for a good YA fantasy, highly recommend. All right. 
And then another five star read this month was um, Iscariot by Tosca Lee. Um, this is one that I wanted to read around Easter time and so I did and this is a biblical fiction that focuses on Judas Iscariot and his life. Um, it starts when he's a kid, it goes all the way up until Jesus's death. Um, if you are not Christian, Judas Iscariot was one of Jesus's disciples who, and he was the one who betrayed him. I need a drink, hold on. Ooh, my throat was going there. All right, um, but he was the one who betrayed him. And so this kind of gets into how could that have happened? He was such a devout follower, follower and then he just betrayed him and turned him in to the high priests and then Jesus was crucified. He pretty much handed him over to be crucified. And this really gets in and delves into what it was like to be a disciple of Christ and on a day-to-day -day basis and what could have been going through Jesus or Jesus through Judas's head, like his thought processes as he betrayed Christ. And this to me was so eye-opening in the perspective that it gave because we can all sit here 2000 years later and be like how could somebody do that he's so evil he's like the biggest villain of all time right like what would have compelled him to do this and to really sit back and think about how jesus was viewed in the eyes of the general public at this time and what could have been happening with the disciples that would have caused them to to um, execute this series of events. So this was really, really well done. I would love to reread it sometime and just get even like it's one of those books. I feel like every time you read it, you would get more out of it. Um, highly recommend. It was very, very, very good. All right. Another one that I read is Elijah of Buxton. This is one that so many people recommended to me. Um, this is by Christopher Paul Curtis. He wrote Bud Not Buddy and Watson's Go to Birmingham 1963. Um, but I had so many people recommend this one specifically said it, that it was their favorite um, to listen to the audio all of that and so I did and I listened to the audio and it was so good. This follows Elijah who lives in Buxton. Buxton is a community that actually existed um, that was right on the Canadian border of America. So on the Canadian side, and it was a basically a commune, I don't know, village, town of escaped slaves. So this was during the 1800s, something like that. Um, and Elijah was the first baby born free in Canada. So he was never a slave. He was the first one born there. So he kind of had a name. And um, this just follows him and kind of growing up in that town and what was going on and the people there and um, what was happening. And then he is called on to help one of the people in town by going back over into America and doing some things. And it was so good. It was really, really well done. Highly recommend yeah all right and then my last book of the month i think i did this right is one of my favorite books of all time it definitely is going to be in a favorite of the year for sure length of a string by Al Alyssa, eliza i don't know um brent wiseman you guys this book i cannot even this is a book that i hauled last month and um kelly from cozy reader kelly was like hey i have that out from the library right now do you want to read that and i'm like uh sure why not um it still has a bookmark in it <laughs> um and so i picked it up with her and you guys oh my goodness this book i sobbed like this entire book pretty much like I started sobbing about here. This is the beginning of the book about here. I started sobbing and like from here to here, I just cried the whole time. It was so good. It was so good. So this is the story of what is her name? Amani, who is Jewish. She is black. She is adopted into a Jewish family and she is preparing for her bat mitzvah. Um, she's going to Hebrew school and preparing for her bat mitzvah. And part of her requirements for her bat mitzvah is that they have to do a project on the Holocaust. They have to pick a some like 
small aspect of the Holocaust and dig into it and do a project on it. Um, and she's trying to decide really what she wants to do. And her parents have told her that instead of having a big bat mitzvah party, they will get her a big gift. Um, and so she has decided that she wants to ask her parents to look into finding her birth parents or specifically her birth, like anything related to her biological parents. She wants to know more about herself. And she's really, really, really nervous to ask her parents about this um, because she feels like it's just gonna break their hearts, you know, all that. So she's prepared to start talking to her parents about this. And then she finds out that her great grandmother has passed away. Her mother, I believe, yeah, her mother's grandmother has passed away. And so they go to her funeral that her mom's a wreck, you know, so she's like, okay, this other thing has to go on the back burner. Um, but in sitting Shiva and like going through all of her grandmother's things, they, she finds her great grandmother's journal from when she fled Luxembourg during World War II and came to Manhattan. So this story is told part in journal entries from her great grandmother's journal, journal, that's not a word, um, journal, you know, from when she was living in Manhattan um, in 1942, I wanna say, I'm not gonna be able to remember now, 1941. Um, and then it goes back to like present day Amani reading the journal, how it's affecting her, um, what's going on with her parents, the whole adoption thing, all of that. You guys, this book broke me apart. It put me back together again. I literally closed the book, called my mom and said, mom, you need to read this right now. You're gonna love it. And she read it and she loved it. Um, this book was so good. Um, it talks about such a small, like it talks, about um, her great grandmother who came from Luxembourg which is such a small country you really don't ever hear about it so it talks about you know the effect of World War II on that country it also talks about what it was like living in Manhattan during the start of World War One World War One World War Two and like what that entailed oh it was so good I will say Amani's mom in this book frustrated the crap out of me she was uh i like kind of wanted to throat punch her but i feel like that's not a nice thing to say so i probably shouldn't say that but i'm like woman get your crap together like so i mean not all the characters were perfect but everything else about this book i loved so much i could not deter it couldn't deter me from like giving it a five star because i loved it that much and i kind of want to go reread it now so that was my favorite book of the month that's it. Those are all the books that I read in April. Um, if you've read any of these, as always, I would love to hear your comments about them down below in the comment section. Um, what was your favorite book that you read in April? Let me know. And I hope that you enjoyed this. And I hope that you stick around and subscribe. And until next time, see ya.